Welcome to Duke University School of Law. And on behalf of the Environmental Law and Policy Clinic, my name is Reich Longest. I'm the director of the Environmental Law and Policy Clinic. I wanted to welcome you to this lunchtime talk. Uh, we'd also like to, at the very beginning, thank all of our co-sponsors for this lunch event. The in, uh, staff and uh, uh, affiliates with North Carolina Warren or NC Warren and the Climate Times, uh, Jim, Rita, Annie, Anna, Nancy, John, everybody else that I forgot, Harvard, everyone else I've forgotten to mention, stand up so that everybody can see you, please. You. See that <laughs> we also have two expert speakers today uh, and lots of well-informed guests in the room, so we're hoping for a very lively and engaging discussion. Among some of the guests that we have today, we have uh, Bill Powers, a 30-year um, veteran of the electric uh, power industry, an engineer with expertise including distributed energy, efficiency programs, and other means of avoiding uh, the expense and impacts of large um, EGUs. We also have Dr. Bill Schlesinger, biochemist. Dr. Schlesinger, I think I saw you right down here. Uh, and he's the president emeritus of the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. Uh, before taking that head, he was also the Dean of the Nicholas School of the Environment here. And just walking in, we have Jonathan Weiner, a uh, professor here who holds appointments at Duke Law School, Nicholas School of the Environment, and Sanford School of Public Policy, so he's a triple threat. Um, and uh, Jonathan, interestingly enough, as I was preparing for this talk, I realized um, when going back through one of Jonathan's papers we'll talk about in a minute, that back in 1992, he had actually raised this issue of the need to have a comprehensive policy uh, on control of all greenhouse gases, not just focusing piecemeal on carbon dioxide. Uh, so it's been a long time since 1992, but here we are today talking about the same topic. So today our topic is going to be focusing on natural gas as a bridge fuel, and we're going to talk about an aspect of the story about which emerging um, scientific research is really beginning to um, uh, show a lot of alarm bells. Natural gas, or methane, uh, has become a dominant fossil fuel in the United States. Um, four years ago, energy tycoon T. Boone Pickens, raise your hand if you're familiar with T. Boone Pickens. Okay, so T. Boone Pickens, um, who's been inundating my uh, Yahoo Mail account with the Pickens plan for going on six or seven years now. But in 2012, he gave a very influential TED talk in which he explained that natural gas was a bridge fuel. His argument was that it was cleaner and cheaper than imported oil. His primary, he did say that he was a believer in climate change, but his primary focus on it was a question of national security, and he was basically arguing that the United States expenses um, related to uh, national defense in the Middle East were directly related to oil imports and that he saw natural gas as a bridge. Uh, we're not going to list all the rationales today that various supporters of the natural gas as bridge fuel have, um, have articulated. If I were to just list them, we would exhaust the time for the lunch hour with just the introductions. Um, but what we want to talk about today are a couple of really key um, critiques that, are, that have emerged over the years regarding the assumption that natural gas is clean, especially as it relates to climate. And so um, a lot of these, some of these issues we're going to talk about today uh, have been things that people have been raising for some time, but this is, uh, this is um, an opportunity to meet two of the experts in the field who have recently been uh, publishing and talking a lot about these issues, and I hope it will be a, a lively exchange. While it's taken 25 years for us to get to the point where we now have an EPA rulemaking on carbon dioxide emissions from the power sector starting last year. And just this month, we now have a methane emissions rulemaking beginning at EPA from the oil and gas sector to reduce methane emissions um, from that sector. And at a more local level, the North Carolina Utilities Commission just recently approved a number of new uh, electrical generating units at the Asheville plant. They um, were approved for two of the units that they had proposed. They were denied for the third peaking proposal. Uh, and the two experts that we're going to have speaking here today uh, filed expert affidavits in, in opposition to uh, the proposal to build these new plants uh, on behalf of North Carolina Warren and the Climate Times. Um, and they're going to discuss their concerns with the use of natural gas as a bridge fuel. I also wanted to let you know that a larger group of folks with a longer uh, panel presentation, a reception, uh, and a larger list of folks talking about a wider variety of issues will be appearing on behalf of NC Warren this evening. The public is invited. You all are invited. You just have to go a little bit closer to Chapel Hill than you might be comfortable with. And I will say it's not all, it's not completely on the, tar the UNC campus, um, but it is much closer than most of you are comfortable with. Now, personally, I'd love to have it in the Dean Smith Center because 
I'm a Tar Heel born and a Tar Heel bred, even though I work here. Um, but uh, the Friday Center, William Friday Center, is out on 54, 7 o'clock. There will be a reception afterwards and a great, uh, much larger panel presentation there as well. So if you like what you heard today, make sure to come back um, for that talk uh, this evening. Um, so now I'm going to introduce our two speakers. So we have in the front here uh, Dr. Bob Howarth. He's a graduate of Amherst College. He's got a PhD jointly held from MIT and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. For more than 30 years, he's been on the faculty at Cornell University as an earth system scientist and ecologist. And he's been studying global change systems since the 1970s. He's published over 200 research papers and edited or written seven books. He served on committees and expert panels at the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and the International Council of Science. Uh, Dr. Howard's expertise that we're going to talk about here today is on the role of methane emissions as a driver of global warming. Uh, and together with other colleagues, including Cornell engineering professor Tony Angrafia, some of you, have any of you, did you have a chance to see Tony Angrafia when he came around a couple of weeks ago? So some of you have seen him. He was around in the Triangle just a few weeks ago. Um, together with, uh, with uh, Professor Ingrafia, Dr. Howarth has been warning that methane leakage from fossil fuel production, refining, and distribution system has been underestimated uh, by the methodologies that U.S. EPA and others have been using. Primarily looking, Dr. Howarth has been working a lot with satellite data and with um, uh, big picture monitoring. We're going to hear about some of that today. And then next, after him, we're going to hear from David Hughes, who was raised at Edmonton, Alberta, and trained in geology at the University of Alberta. And he's been, uh, for nearly four decades, been uh, working in the energy sector, including 32 years at, of service at the Geological Survey of Canada. He was a scientist and a research manager and published extensively on energy and hydrocarbon resource issues. Um, now he's retired from the GSC, and he heads his consult a consulting company specializing in global energy and sustainability issues. He also works as a fellow at the Post Carbon Institute, a nonprofit organization which promotes community resilience and educates the public on issues related to the transition to a post carbon future. Hugh's recent work has included documenting the fast decline of gas resources in shale gas formations and the overstating of shale gas resources initially. Um, so I'd like to uh, ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Howarth. He's going to give our first presentation. Mr. Hughes will follow, and then we'll have a question and answer period. So, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Howard. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you all for coming. I'm really very pleased to, to be here uh, in Durham and in North Carolina today. I think the, the effort against Duke Energy is, is, is critical. You know, Duke is one of the largest power companies in the world. Uh, they have this aggressive view that natural gas is a big part of the future. It's not. I hope we can convince you of that if you're have doubts already, but the fight against Duke, I think, is a, a critical part of, of our uh, climate future here in this country and in the world. So just to remind you, the, the, the Earth is warming. This is from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their last synthesis report from a couple of years ago, and they tell us that uh, each of the last three decades has successively been the warmest uh, ever on record. If you haven't seen it, this is the uh, recent uh, temperature record from last month. We spiked up at 1.6 degrees above the long-term pre-industrial record last year. It'll probably be coming down again a little bit, but the, uh, the Earth is warming. We're going to talk about that as a very dangerous temperature in just a minute. And I was fortunate enough to be one of the delegates at the United Nations uh, COP21 negotiations in Paris a few months ago. And I'm delighted to tell you that coming out of Paris, all of the nations of the world represented there uh, agreed that we need to keep the planet well below 2 degrees Celsius, above the long-term industrial baseline. And they acknowledged that anything above 1.5 degrees is dangerous. That's what the scientific uh, participants in Paris were saying. I was surprised personally that the nations took our advice, but they did. So why? Well. A little bit more. I'll, I'll get to why 1.5 and 2 are dangerous in a minute. Uh, but I want to point out that of the targets which were actually set in Paris at the COP21 UN event, uh, if people, if the nations of the world follow through, we are on a trajectory to reach 3.5 to 4 degrees. That's better than the 6 to 6 degrees we'd be on otherwise, but it's nowhere near where we need to be. I also want to tell you that if we are to meet 
this target of well below 2 degrees and hopefully not much above 1.5, the world needs to be largely free of fossil fuels, the entire world, by 2050. And as a matter of equity, given what we've contributed so far and where we stand uh, in a position to, to move ahead, the United States needs to be largely fossil fuel free by 2035. And finally, to get that, methane reductions are critical. It is impossible, sitting where we are today, to reach that COP21 target, concentrating simply on carbon dioxide reductions. I'll show you some science behind that in a minute. OK, so this is, uh, I'll, I'll show you this slide twice. This time, I just want to point out that we've been uh, warming the planet over the 20th century up through 2011 here. This is a series of model trajectories. We'll talk about some of the others in a minute. But this is the, the reference state of the projected rate of warming as a business uh, as usual scenario. And it says we'll reach a 1.5 degree threshold in about 12 years from now, and in about 35 years, 2 degrees. So that's the trajectory we're on. The reason that the scientific community is concerned about that is that as we hit these kind of temperatures, we're already running some risk of irreversible changes in the climate system, and we're seeing some of those. But the risk becomes much greater of more severe irreversible changes in the climate system as we hit this, particularly 2 degrees, maybe 1.8 degrees, certainly above 2 degrees. 1.5 buys us some safety, but we don't have a lot of time to keep the planet below that. I just want to mention two uh, potential tipping points that are of concern to me. There are many that we can talk about, and all of these are debated in the scientific community. They're all contentious. But one of them is that you know, of the carbon dioxide that human society is putting into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels, over the last uh, century, half of that has been taken up by the world's forests or by the world's oceans. So it's mitigating what's going on. There are very good reasons to think that could change, both in terms of the forest source and in terms of the ocean source. I'm not an expert in the forest. I am an oceanographer, and I, I'm quite worried by the, uh, what I'm seeing in terms of change in ocean circulation and what that might mean for carbon dioxide uptake. The reason I'm showing you this particular slide is this is the carbon dioxide concentration at the Mauna Loa Observatory, where we have the longest record ever and it bounces up, it's high in the northern hemisphere winter, lower in the summer, it's up and down. A uh, couple of things to, to see here. One is that the carbon dioxide emissions globally of the world from fossil fuels have actually been steady. They have not increased over the last three years. That's good news. However, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing, even though emissions are not. And over the last year, the rate of increase is the fastest it has ever been in this time of observation, and the concentration we had in February of this year is the highest it's ever been. So big increases despite the fact that we started, at least temporarily, to stabilize carbon dioxide emissions, and that may be because of less uptake by the world's oceans, perhaps some interaction with terrestrial environments. People are arguing about that. The other tipping point that I'm very concerned about are changes in the natural methane cycle. Uh, we are melting permafrost in the Arctic. We've actually lost 20% uh, of the permanent permafrost of the planet over the last 20 years, globally. And as we also warming coastal oceans, both of those run a risk of increasing methane fluxes to the atmosphere. There's a huge amount of organic carbon tied up in the soils of the, of the permafrost. As that melts and becomes wetland, there's a high potential for methane formation to blow off to the atmosphere. And there are massive amounts of methane in a semi-frozen form on the continental shelves of the world's oceans. We call it methane clathrates. If the planet warms a little bit, we run the risk of melting that. Uh, if it melts fast, it'll bubble to the atmosphere. That's really bad. If it melts slowly, it'll diffuse into the ocean water and be consumed by bacteria, which is probably OK. We actually are seeing an increased melting over the last five to 10 years. So far, it has not bubbled to the surface. It's a slow melt that goes on. We're OK. But as we get above 2 degrees Celsius, the risk of bubbling becomes much greater. So we want to keep the planet below 1.5 degrees. So that takes us to how we get there and, and this idea of, of a bridge fuel. And the idea of a bridge fuel uh, actually, I think it probably goes back about 15 years. A lot of people have proposed it, but the thought is that, yes, climate change is real. We need to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. 
But we can do that, at least for a while, by getting rid of coal, using natural gas instead as a fuel. It doesn't require huge transitions on the part of society, and we can move eventually into the renewable future that everyone wants. And the argument's based on the fact that to get the same amount of energy, you produce substantially more carbon dioxide from coal or from oil than you do from natural gas. Natural gas is a very dense fuel, relatively little carbon dioxide when you burn it to get energy. The problem with the argument is that natural gas is mostly methane. Methane is an incredibly potent greenhouse gas, more than 100 times more potent than carbon dioxide when both gases are in the atmosphere. And if, again, if you look from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they tell us that carbon dioxide currently, carbon dioxide from human emissions contributes 1.66 watts per square meter of warming capacity currently, and methane is one. So methane is less important than carbon dioxide at the moment, even though it's a much more potent greenhouse gas because there's a lot more carbon dioxide, but they're both really important gases. So Tony and Graffia and I uh, started thinking about this and wondering how methane contributions from shale gas development would affect its greenhouse gas footprint. We started about seven years ago. We published the first paper that we put out on it five years ago. It was the first ever peer-reviewed analysis of how methane contributes to the greenhouse gas footprint of shale gas. And I won't tell you much about this other than to uh, remind you again, natural gas is mostly methane, incredibly potent greenhouse gas, so small emissions matter, and we said shale gas emits more than conventional natural gas. Now we did this five years ago based on uh, very poorly documented data. There's very little information out there in the literature, very hard to document anything, but we said this is the best information that's out there, and if you follow it to its logical conclusion, this is a dangerous fuel, not a bridge fuel at all. Now, we got a huge amount of attention and Tony and I ended up as uh, two of the 50 runners-up for Person of the Year in Time Magazine in 2011. I'm not telling you this to brag. I'm telling you that we got a lot of back pressure. We're People of the Year because of our press worthiness, not because we're nice people. And I can prove that by showing you some of the other... The, the, <laughs> I didn't put up all 50 of us, but these are, the, the, these are the people that Tony and I were grouped in with. So a lot of pushback. There are a lot of papers which came out right away saying we're wrong. The White House said we're wrong, industry said we're wrong, a lot of people said we're wrong. But one of our main conclusions was, yes, we're using really limited data. This needs to be done much better. People should go out there and make better measurements of what's going on for methane emissions. And I'm very pleased to say that has happened since our first paper, uh, still less than five years ago. There are now about 120 papers that have been published. Very fast-moving field. So fast that I struggle to keep up with it, but I'm going to try and give you a little bit of a summary. And I'm going to tell you two studies, two of the newer ones, just to give you a sense of what's going on and then tell you my sense of where things sit and what it means. First one is this. I'm a co-author of this. We published it in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences a few years ago. We flew an airplane equipped with a mass spectrometer for measuring methane in real time up and down in southwestern Pennsylvania in the Marcellus Shale area. And this is what the instrument is seeing. So this is uh, relative to one obviously uh, identifiable gas rig on the ground. The hotter colors are more methane, so the plane's flying back and forth and up and down the atmosphere. And you can see that there's a methane plume there, which when we average out looks like that. From this sort of information, we can deduce what the flux of methane to the atmosphere was on that day. It's a one-day study. And that's important. But the fluxes were massive. If you want to ask me questions about there's a lot of fascinating details behind that, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll move on. The study which I am relying on more than that, and I'll show you why in a second, is this. And this is a satellite-based study. It's not my study, but I'm using it. So it's published in 2014. And you can measure methane in the entire atmosphere of the planet from space. And what you're seeing here is from 2003 to 2012. That's the equator. That's the South Pole. That's the North Pole. Methane is increasing over time. So this is averaged around the circumference of the Earth. It's increasing over time, particularly in the northern hemisphere. And when you look geographically across uh, latitude, what you see is that the hot spots were is increasing. This is before the shale gas revolution and after the shale gas revolution. And the hot spots for this increase are from the areas of the shale gas and shale oil revolution. The authors of this paper were able to put some flux numbers on it. 
from this information, and they said that this global increase in methane, globally observable increase in methane, which has an observable influence on the Earth's temperature, is probably due almost 100% to shale gas and oil development in the United States. That's the conclusion of this paper. Okay, this is a busy slide. Let me just quickly talk you through it. What we're looking at here is the percentage of methane uh, that's emitted to the atmosphere as we develop a shale gas well, all the way from the well site to final consumer use percentage. That's our paper with our error estimates from 2011. We said it was about 3.8 plus or minus that. The Environmental Protection Agency agreed with us almost right away, much to our surprise, and came up with that. They got a lot of industry pressure and in 2013 cut their numbers in half and they've been roundly criticized by their own inspector general for doing so because there's no scientific basis for that, for that cutback. All of these uh, other light blue studies are studies like the airplane one. That, that's our airplane study that I showed you a minute ago. These are all other airplane studies and similar sort of open air things. A lot of variance in the rates, and I think there may be many good reasons for that, but almost all of these are one or two day studies. Really short term, they're snapshots. So it could be a lot of temporal variability. Uh, this is the satellite data, which I showed you a minute ago, which I think is the most robust because it integrates in space and time. And one other thing, this is a paper, David Allen of the University of, of Texas, uh, a study organized by Environmental Defense Fund, funded by industry, came up with a really low number. This estimate was very heavily hyped by Environmental Defense Fund and Allen and others. Uh, I sort of believed it for a while, although I was wondering why it was so different from others. Touche Howard, who's over there in the corner and is a local resident for you here in this area, has published two papers. This one came out last summer. Uh, he's an expert on the instrumentation here, and at least in my mind, he's very convincingly demonstrated that the Allen et al. paper is fundamentally flawed due to misuse of the instrument, and the number is too low. So one should probably discard it, and he can talk to you more about why if you like. So, where does that leave us in terms of the greenhouse gas footprint of shale gas? Well, what I'm showing you here is for coal, oil, conventional natural gas, and shale gas, the greenhouse gas footprint for carbon dioxide only in the yellow, and for methane as carbon dioxide equivalents in the red, using for the shale gas the satellite data I just showed you, and integrating over a 20 year time period after emissions, this is a disastrous fuel from a climate perspective. It's even more disastrous than that might indicate, though. And that's because, in this slide again, which I showed you before, if we do nothing, the planet will warm like that. If we aggressively control carbon dioxide emissions starting in 2011, 2012, there are lags in the climate system, but eventually the planet will stop warming, but we're going to still reach dangerous temperatures very, very soon. If we control methane emissions, either methane alone or methane and carbon dioxide, we slow the rate of warming immediately because the planet responds far more rapidly to methane. So if we want to keep below these dangerous temperatures that the COP agreement tells us we should, we have got to reduce methane emissions. And the number one source of methane in the United States is the oil and gas industry, and shale gas has aggravated that. So it's a dangerous fuel we want to get rid of. Almost done with the data here. <laughs> This is the greenhouse gas inventory of the entire United States from using fossil fuels. That's what carbon dioxide has done. And carbon dioxide uh, went up to about 2007 with the recession and with some conversion of coal to natural gas. It's gone down. This is what industry will tell you. It's what the government tells you. CO2 emissions are down. That's true. With what I think is an appropriate accounting for methane, instead we see a little dip in 2007 and then with the shale gas explosion continuing, we now have the fastest greenhouse gas rise in our nation's history, and methane is becoming increasingly dominant, precisely at the time when we should be cutting methane emissions if we're to reach those short-term things. So it's a disastrous fuel. I think we have alternatives. Uh, I was a co-author of a paper by Mark Jacobson, published a few years ago, where we laid out a plan for the state of New York to become largely fossil fuel free by 2030. I won't go through much detail here, other than to just tell you that uh, uh, a major part of the plan is to electrify heating and transportation, which greatly reduces energy consumption overall because of efficiencies. We'd rely only on technologies that are commercially available today, so this isn't some pipe dream into the future. 
cost effective, et cetera, jobs. And I just want to point out that uh, I, I've started to live this myself. It, it is cost effective. That's my farmhouse in cold upstate New York. Uh, we are carbon neutral. We heat with geothermal. We produce our own electricity for the most part. We buy the rest from solar. I drive an electric car when I can. This is all cost affordable on a university professor's salary. So again, thank you for the, the chance to talk to you today. Uh, I think particularly coming out of Paris, given the climate targets that are set, we need to demethane the planet, and that means no shale gas. Mm -hmm. So, and you guys are in the front crowd here with Duke Energy. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Howarth, and we're now going to move on and have uh, Mr. Hughes come and present to us, and we're going to talk uh, in this um, uh, presentation, we're going to focus a little bit more on the question of cost and cost effectiveness as it relates to um, shale resources and, uh, and, and the ways in which um, shale resources uh, have been overestimated uh, historically. So. Um, uh, Mr. Hughes, come on, and we'll uh, let you uh, drive from here. You've got a mic and all, and there's the flipper. So. Great. Thanks a lot. Again, my pleasure uh, to be here. First time I've been in North Carolina. What I'm going to talk to you about today is based on an analysis of the major shale plays, shale gas and tidal oil, that was published in late 2014. Uh, basically, I looked at 82% of the tight oil production in the U.S. and 88% of the shale gas. And, and I used uh, one of the best commercial databases of well production data available, Drilling Info, uh, based in Austin, Texas. So what I'd like to do is, is look at conventional wisdom on shale. I'd like to look at uh, the fundamentals of shale plays. Uh, they're very similar from play to play geologically. I'll give you a couple of examples of some of the, the two biggest shale plays in the U.S. and what that means in terms of long-term energy sustainability. So if you look at conventional wisdom, uh, that would be that the U.S. is on the verge of energy independence, even though it's a very heavy importer of oil still, uh, even with the growth in tidal oil production. Shale gas production will continue to grow for the foreseeable future and prices will remain low, which is why companies like Duke Energy are, are interested in converting from coal to natural gas. The way is clear for U.S. LNG exports to monetize the shale gas bounty. The first LNG tanker went to Europe uh, a few weeks ago. Shale gas production, although temporarily in decline, can be turned around very quickly with a slight increase in price. The sky is the limit when it comes to increasing production. A map of North America shale plays produced a few years back uh, basically would have us believe that shale plays are, are ubiquitous, they're very widespread, so there's a, a huge potential upside for production. The latest projection out of the EIA, the Energy Information Administration, uh, U.S. Department of Energy, on production of gas going forward. All of the traditional sources, uh, conventional gas, type gas, coal bed methane, and so forth, are more or less flat through 2040. So all of the growth is shale gas. They're projecting nearly 100% growth in shale gas by 2040 from 2012 levels at relatively low prices. They're suggesting in 2040 that 16% of US production will be exported. The latest EIA projection uh, of shale gas production through 2040 by play. Two of these plays, the Marcellus and Haynesville, account for 49% of total production from 2014 to 2040. The top three plays account for 61%. So even though it looks like shale gas plays are very widespread, High quality shale gas plays are relatively rare. Shale gas production in the U.S. Uh, up to December of 2015, and you can see the spectacular growth. It really is a technological phenomenon. 
went from very little to more than half of U.S. gas production. It peaked in October 2015. That's not necessarily the, the final peak. Uh, we're probably on a plateau because of low gas prices. But I'd also like to point out that five legacy plays peaked in August 2012 and are now down 32% below peak. So the question is, how long will these plays last? From my review of shale plays, uh, I developed what I call the shale play life cycle. Discovery followed by a leasing frenzy. A play like the Haynesville was unknown in 2007 in Louisiana. Discovery is followed by a drilling boom. Most leases come with held by production clauses, so you have to drill in order to hold the lease. Sweet spots are identified. These plays are not uniform. They typically have core areas, which are maybe 10 to 20% of the total, total play area. Companies always drill their best locations first. So the sweet spots are being drilled off as we speak. Production rises rapidly and is maintained for cash flow despite potentially uneconomic full cycle costs. Sweet spots become saturated with wells and well quality and field production decline. Plays like the Haynesville become middle-aged after just five years. This is the Haynesville uh, from discovery back in 2007. Through the drilling boom, it was the biggest shale gas play in the U.S when it peaked in 2011. It's now down 50% below peak. And if we look at the distribution of wells in the Haynesville by well quality, so these wells are colored by initial, product, initial production. So how much gas comes out when you first put the well on production? So the red wells are the highest quality wells. They're a relatively small part of the total play grading down to the black wells, which are essentially totally uneconomic at today's gas price. Shale plays have very steep well decline rates. This is the average well decline in the Haynesville, 89% over the first three years. So the message is you have to keep drilling in order to maintain production. The decline of all wells drilled prior to 2014. So this is the, the so-called static field decline. If you just stop drilling, how fast will the field go down? And that's about 41% in the first year. So 41% of the production has to be replaced by more drilling just to keep production flat. And that hasn't been happening in the Haynesville. If we look at the drilling rate over time, that's the red, the red curve. It peaked at about 1,100 wells per year back in 2012. It fell to about 700. You need about 700 wells per year to, to hold production at 7 billion cubic feet per day. That's an investment of $6.3 billion at 9, 9 million a well uh, per year to keep production flat. Production has fallen to about 200 wells per year. and or, the, number, the, the rate of drilling has fallen to 200 wells per year. Production has fallen to about 3 billion cubic feet per day. So to hold it at that, at that level, you need about 2 billion a year uh, investment to drill more wells. Average well quality. Uh, companies will tell you that the technology is getting better, longer frack stages, higher volume injection. And that's true uh, to a certain extent. This is average well quality per year over the first year, and it has risen, but it peaked in 2014 in the Haynesville and it's now declining. That's both because of companies sat concentrating on the sweet spots and the ultimate decline. When you put wells too close together, they interfere with one another and they don't produce as much gas, and that's happening in several of the best shield plays as we speak. So it's a question of how many wells can you put into a sweet spot? This is what the sweet spot of the Hensville looks like right now. Most of these are multi-well pads. Typically, they're built on four to five acre pads and several wells are drilled from each pad. These wells have 5,000 foot laterals. So each lateral is extending out about a mile. 
and it's just a question of how many more wells can you pack into that space before you have to move into lower quality parts of the play. For my review of the shale plays, I made three uh, projections based on drilling rate. Uh, future production solely depends on how fast you drill. So if you increase drilling substantially, you could turn that decline around for a while. My most likely rate was the, the red curve, about the same as what is happening right now, or a low drilling rate. I compared that to the EIA projection for the Haynesville uh, published in April of last year. This is my projection, the purple. This is the EIA's projection. So they, they're more or less agreeing with me for the next uh, year or so, but then they're having a spectacular production ramp up in the Haynesville. And I can't see any geological reason for why that would, would happen. You'd have to have a, a fantastic drilling rate and a lot of locations in order to make that happen. I don't think it is geologically possible. So there's a lot of optimism built into the EIA projections that are making gas companies like Duke Energy think that gas will be cheap forever. Second play I like to look at is the Marcellus. You probably heard a lot about that. Bob's work has been on that. A huge play extending from West Virginia through Pennsylvania into New York State. If you look at what's happened, uh, same as the, the Haynesville, basically unknown in 2007, 2008, huge growth. The, Haines, the Marcellus now produces a third of US shale gas. It peaked in April 2015. It's probably on a plateau right now uh, for maybe a couple more years before it starts to decline. If you look at the distribution of wells by quality, you can see the same effect that we saw in the Haynesville sweet spots, uh, prominent sweet spot in northeastern Pennsylvania, another one in southwestern Pennsylvania, and northern uh, West Virginia. But a lot of the vast area of the Marcellus has pretty low quality wells that are, are certainly far from economic. If we look at cumulative gas production by county in the Marcellus, we can see that those two northeast counties, Bradford and Susquehanna, have produced 39% of all the gas that's been produced in the Marcellus. The top five counties produce 68%, the top eight counties, 81%. So the message here is the sweet spots are a relatively small part of the total play area. Average well decline curves by county in the Marcellus. You can see why so much gas has been produced from the Susquehanna, the top curve, Bradford, the dark blue curve, all other counties, the dotted black curve. So companies are, are saturating the best counties as we speak. Estimated ultimate recovery of the average well by county. Again, you can see how good the wells are in Susquehanna by comparison to most of the other counties in the play. So you get triple, for, for the expenditure of, of a well, same well cost, you get three times as much gas if you drill in a sweet spot. I looked at well quality over time by county in the Marcellus, and you can see in most counties there's a huge ramp up in well quality from 2012 to 2014, and that is essentially stopped. So technology has hit the law of diminishing returns in terms of growing production from these wells. And in, in some cases, it's, it's been beginning to decline. And that's because the sweet spots are becoming saturated with wells. And that will only get worse as time goes on. The sweet spot in Northeast Pennsylvania, the Marcellus, uh, this is what it looks like now, Susquehanna and Bradford. A close up, you can see Dimmock, the town that Rudy uh, got the film Gasland started. And if we look at a close up around Dimmock, which is right there, we can see that well concentration is now six to eight wells per square mile. And that's 
pretty much pushing the limit of how close you can space wells in a sweet spot. This is my projection for the Marcellus that I made in 2014, uh, peaking in 2018, followed by a gradual decline. There will be a lot of gas that's produced from the Marcellus, but the question is how fast can you produce it uh, compared to the EIA projections. This is my forecast in purple compared to the EIA projection. Again, we're almost identical out to about 2022 when the EIA projects a, a vast ramp up in Marcellus production. And again, that's not geological po geologically possible if you look at things like well quality and, and sweet spot distribution. That's all built into that big red blob I showed you right at the beginning. If we look at seven of the top shale plays in the US, this is uh, initial productivity of wells, sweet spots compared to average. And you can see how good the Marcellus and the Haynesville are by comparison to the other major shale gas plays. So the message is shale gas plays are not ubiquitous. They're uh, quite unique, quite rare. If you add up the major plays that I looked at, uh, for my 2014 report, 88% of 2014 production. I projected a peak in 2017 from those plays followed by a decline. The Haynesville and Marcellus will be producing more than two thirds of the gas in 2040. This is the EIA projection for those same plays. So they're projecting a, a huge ramp up. I didn't go through the other plays, but there's you know, a huge amount of optimism built into their projections for them. So according to the EIA, these plays will be producing 170% more gas in 2040 than, than my projection based on a geological analysis. The EIA was very bullish on other plays. Uh, and it's true, there are other plays. I didn't look at the Utica. Uh, the Utica is now up to about 3 billion cubic feet per day. So it's small uh, so far, but it, it does have potential. And certainly there will be gas produced from these other plays, but I expect the same level of optimism has been built into these other play forecasts as the ones that I looked at. So just to summarize, shale gas has been a game changer in the short term. But projections of long-term sustainability at low prices are highly questionable. High quality shale plays are not ubiquitous. Shale plays are not uniform. Sweet spots are exploited early in the development process. The best parts of major shale plays are being drilled now. High well decline rates require a drilling treadmill and high capital inputs to sustain production at offset field declines, along with associated environmental impacts that Bob talked about, and there's many other uh, shorter term impacts of, of shale wells. Assuming long-term sustainability of production at low prices is folly for energy policy. The shale revolution is a temporary windfall and should be viewed as such. US energy independent Independence with a forecast energy trajectory is highly unlikely, barring a radical reduction in co consumption and a major ramp up of renewable energy. A sustainable energy future requires a vision beyond the next couple of quarters or the next election. In the absence of a coherent plan, investments assuming cheap oil and gas in the long term are very likely to end badly. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, questions that we have. I shouldn't say invades. Occupies. Um, what, uh, what, uh, what questions do you all have for our experts? Well, for the first professor, it was really good. Um, you know, Jacobson is Stanford, right? They did a, him and another guy did an article in Scientific American in 2012. And I've heard from engineering friends that that, that article's too old and it's dated or whatever, but they were saying, you know, 100% 
renewables is possible, you know, already, and it's, it's ready to go. And the only part that was a problem was the so-called rare earth minerals that aren't really rare, but they're called that. Can you comment on why that 100% uh, renewables yeah, is, just is just not the, up to date? Mark, Mark Jacobson and others, uh, Mark Zabucci, the co-author you're talking about, uh, wrote a series of technical papers circa 2006 to 2009 or so. Scientific American pieces actually in 2010, I believe, 2009. Uh, as I say, he and I and others, including Mark Zanucci, wrote a, a later report in 2013 saying how it would play out in the state of New York, looking at real jobs, real people, real resources, real costs. Uh, and we published one for California in 2014. Mark has now developed a plan for all 50 states. And you know, he, he's backed off a little bit in terms of the timing. He thinks it'll take till 2050 to really be there. But if you look at our New York plan, we called it the 2030 plan because we said it would be largely free of fossil fuels by 2030. Uh, and it was, you know, it's, uh, our projections were, if we worked aggressively on it, that we could be about 95% free of fossil fuels by 2030. The last 5% are things like getting jet fuel out of airplanes and stuff. It's a <laughs> right. tough, tough thing. But in terms of, you know, if you look at where most energy in, in our state is used, it's uh, home heating, commercial heating, it's mostly natural gas, low hanging fruit to put heat pumps in, move aggressively towards renewable power, uh, electric vehicles. Uh, so Mark is quite optimistic at this point. And I, I share his optimism with those who are Any other questions? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> under current trajectory, how likely do you think we are to trigger uh, the types of feedbacks you were identifying, like the decreased ocean absorption of carbon dioxide and uh, substantial permafrost melt in uh, the northern hemisphere. It, it's really hard to know. I mean, the planet's warming at the most rapid it's ever warmed. Right? The place in the last really warm periods. And so you, you can surmise some things from the geological record, but it, it's hard to know. Uh, you know, the, I think the scientific community is pretty strongly in agreement that thresholds and tipping points are possible, and whether they happen at 2 degrees or 2.5 degrees or 3 degrees or 1.5 degrees varies on the tipping point. And there's disagreement about that, and we're not going to know. They're all based on surmising from the geological record or on models, a huge amount of uncertainty. If you want to be safe, we're going to keep the planet cool. And the one that we're seeing now that we're quite sure of is that some of the Antarctic ice sheet is melting, the result of climatic warming. If we were to stop climatic warming today, that particular sheet will continue to melt over the next 50 to 100 years as that will rise sea level, right? As we warm more, more of the Antarctic sheet becomes at risk, the Greenland sheet becomes at risk. And those things too, once they start, those are irreversible changes over the time scales of several millennia. Exactly when we're gonna hit them, hard to say. The issue on the methane clathrates is uh, warming of the continental shelves, and people argue about it all over the place. Uh, if you'd asked me a year ago, I would have been more worried than I am now. I've got good friends at the University of Stockholm who are looking at that in the Arctic uh, Ocean on the continental shelves, and, and they tell me that, uh, that there's some hot spot melting with a little bit of bubbling to the surface, but that 99% places, 99 of the places they're sampling, the melting is slow enough that it's not reaching the atmosphere, they think they'll probably continue. I think they're probably right. But there's a lot of uncertainty associated with that, and do we really want to do that experiment? On the, on the CO2 uptake by the world's oceans, the argument there is that a lot of the carbon dioxide we're making in the atmosphere is taken up by the oceans. It's a chemical dissolution into the coldest oceans of the world. The large, large part of that's the North Atlantic Ocean, which is the coldest, uh, densest, saltiest ocean on Earth. That sinks, it stays in the bottom waters of the oceans for uh, a few centuries while it moves south through the Atlantic and eventually upwells in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Uh, there is good evidence that that rate of sinking is slowing. And it's slowing because of melting of the Arctic sea ice and the Greenland ice and because of increased precipitation and runoff in you know, Siberia. The North Atlantic Ocean is not as salty now as it was 30 years ago. And that matters globally. And there are actual data on the fluxes and it looks to be going down. That's very scary. Thank you both for this presentation. Um, very sobering in a way. I have a question in terms of like the current infrastructure and in regards to leaks. I think that's a big one in terms of uh, production and also uh, unconventional sources too, such as tar sands. 
uh, which are also being pushed forward in this country as well. Any comments there in terms of that impact uh, in addition to discussion of methane? Let me just cut briefly on the leaks and then turn over to David and address. The T.J. Howard and I and others were talking over breakfast this morning about the leaks. And he correctly pointed out that we could do a, a lot to reduce the leakage rate now. We're not. That tells you something. Uh, industry and government keeps going, oh, we're going to solve it. We'll have standards to take care of. I'm, I'm skeptical that in the world we live in, we're really going to regulate it well. So technically, we could do a much better job. Is it going to be good enough? I don't think so, personally. So I think we ought to just get rid of this refuel idea and move into the 21st century. First. But, but there is a lot that could be done to make it. Yeah, I actually just finished a report on Canada. You know, we signed on to COP21. Uh, we have politicians that are you know, really keen on doubling Canada's gas production, mainly through shale, and selling it to China, you know, via LNG off the West Coast. We got a new uh, quotation mark socialist government in Alberta who came out with a climate leadership plan in, in November uh, to cap the oil sands at 100 megatons of, of CO2 per year which is effectively a 40% ramp up. Um, so I just did the math, you know, if you build five LNG terminals, you know, double Canada's gas production and increase the oil sands by 40%, which is the ambitions of politicians right now, the oil and gas sector, upstream oil and gas sector, not burning the oil and gas, just the upstream emissions, are about 25% of Canada's emissions right now. They would grow to 52% if, if those political ambitions came to fruition, the rest of the economy would have to decrease by 54% by 2030. Is that going to happen? Not a chance. So, I, you know, politicians have to come, you know, to a, a, a basically a reality check on what these political ambitions mean in terms of greenhouse gas. You know, it's a have your cake and eat it too kind of philosophy and uh, my report's going to come out in May and I hope it's going to at least provide the data that people need to uh, be thinking about but I, I don't you know right now I don't see that there's a hope that Canada could meet uh, its COP21 commitments. The US you know there's going to be a lot of substitution of, of nat natural gas for coal and there's a lot of coal generation in the U.S., so that may give them a bigger chunk in order to be able to reduce emissions, uh, or as, as much renewables as possible, you know, get on to that way of thinking. Uh, but in terms of Canada, our, our electrical uh, production system is already 82% carbon free, you know, so much large hydro and, and nuclear that there's not many other places for us to look other than the upstream sector like tar sands and... Uh, and shale gas. If I could just comment a little bit on the, on the COP21 targets, and, and on the, as I said, they're nowhere near enough to reach the, the targets, but to start. I, I've come out of Paris fairly optimistic, not because we're on the right trajectory necessarily, but because the nations have politically all said, yes, we need to do this. And there's a mechanism in place for transparent review going ahead. So, you know, the international uh, scientific community, I think, will be weighing in over the next three to five years and talking about you saying we have to do a hell of a lot more. And the agreement in Paris came not because of brilliant political leadership at the top, it came from grassroots efforts, right? So if the, those grassroots efforts grow and continue, and we have the transparency to show that we're not on target in three, four years going forward, I'm cautiously optimistic that within eight to ten years we'll have a wake up and a change. And Two power, what we're doing with two powers talking about first. I'm optimistic that we're finally on the right trajectory. Uh, one last question. I was just curious about the EIA and speaking about transparency, I guess it's a good segue. Like, who is the EIA accountable to? And I mean, if they're coming up with these numbers that you seem to think are fantastical, I mean, is that a government agency? I mean, is that a taxpayer-funded study? I mean, if it is, what, what should we be doing? Yeah. <laughs> it, it is. That's the U.S. Department of Energy that's making those projections. And that's why companies like Duke are so uh, 
keen on natural gas uh, because they think it's going to be cheap for the foreseeable future. Uh, so I'm probably not, not very well liked in terms of the EIA. I keep publishing these uh, projections uh, or, or analysis of their projections, and they're good enough to give me the play-by-play -play, uh, breakdown, which is not published. So they've, they've been you know, pretty forthcoming with me. But nonetheless, uh, I don't know why they do that. I mean, they, they've been caught off guard in terms of shale gas. They made a series of very pessimistic projections uh, a few years ago, but now it's looked like they've overcompensated in the other, other direction. And that's damaging in terms of the money that's being put into energy infrastructure as we speak. Because these, these are 30 year investments, you know, 30 or 40 year investments. It, it is political agencies as, as, as part of the Department of Energy. The moment the Secretary of Energy is Arnold Manese, who was a professor at MIT, and while at MIT was running an institute that was very heavily funded by the natural gas industry to promote shale gas. Mm -hmm. And his number two person at DOE used to be his number two person at MIT, and before that she was a lobbyist for the oil and gas. So there is a, there's an influence of industry in this. I think at the actual analyst level, I think they're sharp people doing their best. But it's a hard business, I think David's done better. And there is a political aspect, which I think you can't ignore. Mm -hmm. You all join me in thanking our guests. Mm -hmm.